I'd like to introduce Don Mitchell. It's a real privilege to have him here. Um, Don is a distinguished professor of geography at Syracuse University, New York. Um, he is very well known for writing and projects that he develops, but I know, Fulia and I know his work principally through its, its writing. For us, it was very, one of the key, key books, um, or the key, the key text that we uh, used to develop this symposium um, was, was Don's writing on rights to the city and rights to social space. He also writes about property and justice and distribution and migration, uh, a man with many themes, but they all come under the banner of rights to civic life. Don, I'd like to welcome you up to the symposium now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to the organizers. This is a great privilege for me to, uh, to be here, to be able to uh, talk about, um, about rights to the city, uh, about social housing, housing the social, and what I'm going to be talking about today, which is uh, tent cities, focusing particularly on the, um, on the most marginalized, uh, the most unhoused in U.S. cities. And uh, if we get these pictures up, that's what I'll be talking about in any event. There it is. I will be talking about this, but I'm going to be talking about this, these lessons on the right to the city from the urban interstices by way of examples, by way of stories. I'm not going to be talking theoretically, at least overtly, very much. But there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to draw out some of the theoretical and the political implications in what I'm, uh, in what I'm talking about. It will also be a, um, a good chance to think about what's going on right now, not just among the homeless and the poorly housed, but in uh, the Occupy movements. You will see that much of what I'm talking about bears directly on that. And again, I'm not going to say a lot explicitly about that, but I'm sure you'll be able to see where many of the parallels are and why they might matter. So let me start with an example. It's an example from Camden, New Jersey. The example is as typical as it is depressing. Maybe the specific deprivations that make up the context for what I'm about to tell you are more extreme than might be found in some other parts of the United States. But as the editors of the expose from which I draw this story suggest, Camden stands as a warning of what huge pockets of America could turn into. The editors call Camden the city of ruins, an appellation that could just as easily be applied to Detroit, Youngstown, whole swaths of the south side of Chicago or the north side of Philadelphia, to much of Cleveland, Oakland, and St. Louis, to not a little bit of Los Angeles, and though perhaps less starkly visibly so, to pockets of Denver, Seattle, San Diego, and Atlanta. Written by investigative journalist and former war correspondent Chris Hedges, the story of Camden's, the story of Camden's destruction by the forces of capitalism make for sober reading. Camden's real unemployment rate, Hedges writes, is likely between 30 and 40 percent. Median household income is $24,600, or a little bit more than half of the U.S. as a whole. The high school dropout rate is 70 percent, and city services are being radically slashed. The police force in a city routinely described as America's most violent was cut by half in 2011, libraries by two-thirds, and all departments by at least 25%. And if that is not enough, the political establishment in Camden is deeply, deeply corrupt. The political boss runs the city from a, from a suburb, not even bothering to live in the city that he dominates. Though Campbell's Soup has retained its corporate headquarters in the city, there is virtually no manufacturing in what had used to be an industrial giant. Shipbuilding, electronics, food manufacturing, and more have all fled for greener pastures or distant shores. And as Hedges puts it, Camden is the poster child of post-industrial decay. It stands as a warning of what huge pockets of the United States could turn into as we cement into place a permanent underclass of the unemployed slash state and federal budget, federal services in a desperate attempt, a desperate bid to cut massive deficits. Watch cities and states go bankrupt and struggle to adjust to a stark neo-feudalism in which the working and middle classes are decimated. 
In the midst of Camden's post-apocalyptic landscape, a landscape torn apart, destroyed, and left for dead in capital's never-ending war against humanity, dozens of homeless people, perhaps 60 of them, lived in tents and tarpaulin shelters under an interstate highway on-ramp. They called their encampment Transition Park. This was one redoubt, only one redoubt of the city's homeless. There had to be others. Camden City, Camden City counted 775 people as officially homeless, but there are only 220 shelter beds in the whole of the county. The mayor of Transitional Park, according to Hedges, ran the tent city like a military encampment. The mayor had an assistant, whom he called rather ironically his CEO, and together they conducted tent inspections every weekend held a camp meeting every week and posted rules banning drugs, fighting, selling food stamps, and prostitutes bringing their tricks back into the camp, as well as requiring trash to be picked up. Repeat violators were expelled from the camp. A guard detail was established to keep residents safe at night. Amidst the ruins, this was survival, and it was self-organization. This was the interst interstices of the city put to use. Transitional park was not a commons, and though an alternative to the abject, isolated, disorganized life of the street, it was not really an alternative to the world that capital and its flight likes to make. But it was something. And it was something the city, in fact, tolerated through the winter of 2010, perhaps because it seemed to have no other option. But the visibility of that something, perhaps the potential of the interstices themselves, eventually became too much. With spring's arrival, therefore, also came the wrecking crews. Those tossed out scattered, and about a half dozen migrated to live in squalor under the concrete ramps of Route 676, where it runs across the river into Philadelphia. The alternative that was no alternative was now no more, destroyed for no good reason except that city leaders thought that it was a blight on their already thoroughly blighted landscape. This often is the fate of tent cities, not only in Camden, but also in Fresno or Phoenix, Sacramento or St. Petersburg, Florida. As soon as tent cities spring up, as soon as they get organized well enough to provide a bit of security for their residents, they're destroyed. How come? That's what I want to talk about today, how come? In a lengthy, though still highly partial account and deeply problematic account, Law scholar Robert Ellickson in 1996 asserted that skid rows in the 1960s American city, in these skid rows, police had homeless men, bums as Ellickson calls them, right where they wanted them. As long as homeless people stuck to their district, the city provided a space for them. Aspects of this argument can also be found in geographer Jim Duncan's influential and important argument in 1978 about what he called the tramps, classification, and use of space. But Duncan, Duncan goes a step farther than Ellickson did, showing how it's precisely through the marginal, or what I am here calling the interstitial, spaces of the city that made it possible for homeless men to survive. In this struggle for survival, visibility mattered. To the degree that homeless men were confined to Skid Row, then they could keep out of sight. To the degree their numbers were not huge, their encampments were hidden away under bridges or in back alleys or behind abandoned buildings, they were tolerated. Episodic visibility to panhandle or to catch cigarettes, to visit soup kitchens or to take an occasional day job was tolerated in non-Skid Row locales just so long as this visibility neither became large nor more than episodic. The interstices were the spaces of survival. They were, in liberal philosopher Jeremy Waldron's terms, spaces where homeless people could be. Even more than the public property that Waldron felt kept homeless people from the annihilation that would face them if we truly lived in what he calls a libertarian paradise, ironically called a libertarian paradise, of only private property, the abandoned, in-between, and unsurveyed spaces of the city, whether politically or privately owned, together with the relatively benign Skid Row, provided the very conditions of possibility for being men without property, to use Jim Duncan's term. But Ellickson and Duncan's accounts of Skid Row are partial, because Skid Rows never were, were really such an abandoned space. 
They played a vital economic function in industrial era America, as did tramping, that is, homeless and migratory workers. And neither were they particularly benign locations. The police could be impressively violent in their control of tramping workers, homeless men, and alcoholics on the street. And the private violence of jack rollers and muggers took its steady toll. And now, of course, in city after city, if not in Camden, which in any event never really had a developed Skid Row, Philadelphia took care of that function, Skid Row has been thoroughly gentrified, brought in from the margins, from the interstices, and into the heart of the city. Nonetheless, interstices in cities remain, under bridges, in abandoned lots waiting redevelopment, on the grounds of old factories, in the scrub and silt of the rivers that run through town, and they remain vital for homeless people and their pursuit of life. Sometimes these inter interstitial spaces become, for homeless people, absolutely central. They become tent cities, relatively stable encampments, encampments of desperately poor people. Poor people's encampments have a long and important history in the United States. During America's post-Civil War industrialization, tramps, that is migratory, casual, and predominantly male workers, slept just about anywhere they could, as Tim Cresswell has put it. Munic municipal lodging houses, jailhouse floors, rescue missions, single room occupancy, as well as cage hotels of Skid Row, bunk houses provided by employers at lumber camps and farm camps, and sometimes park benches all form part of the Tramps Archipelago of housing. But of particular significance what was, is what was known as the jungle. Usually Tramps jungles, that is encampments, developed in wastelands near the railroad, which was the primary mode of travel for tramping workers. Jungles might have been permanent or temporary, but they existed with a strict code, a culture, if you like, of mutuality, even if this mutuality was organized around hierarchy, especially, in fact, in sexual relations. Sharing in the jungle was a sine qua non. If one had a decent stake, that is, a bit of money, they were expected to look out for their brothers who did not, and in the knowledge that the tables would soon be turned. According to the so-called hobo sociologist Nels Anderson, the jungles were frequently multiracial. Indeed, the jungle was frequently a political place, especially after the founding of the industrial workers of the world, known as the IWW or the Wobblies, in 1905. No doubt tramping casual workers who lived off and on in the jungles were a despised class, condemned as, to quote one account of the day, beggars, mental inferiors, habitual drunks, and lousy workers. A kind of condemnation that has, of course, lived down through the ages and more or less defines dominant perceptions of the contemporary homeless. Against such characterizations, however, tramping workers created their own political culture in which the jungle, the encampment, was central. Seeking to both capitalize on and revolutionize this culture, IWW organizers traveled with the unions under their hat, with the union under their hats, as the saying went taking the local with them on the road. In the Western United States, they specifically sought to organize casual laborers within the jungles. Through both formal recruiting for the one big union and through less formal agitation, not only in jungles, but quite famously on the streets and in the empty lots of main, the main stem, or Skid Row, the IWW sought to turn migratory and homeless workers into a revolutionary class or if not entirely that, then at least a radical one, ready to fight for its rights as workers and as outcasts. In doing so, the IWW developed a particular renown among migratory workers. Indeed, as one undercover agent in California wrote of the IWW in 1914, the extent of this organization's workings are almost beyond belief. We see the notices everywhere. You hear wobblies spoken of favorably in jungle conversations. There is widespread knowledge of and interest in its doings that is of far more than passing importance in any consideration of the problems concerned with this organization. The jungle was a space of organizing for the IWW. It's a space of worry at the same time and of danger for the bourgeoisie. Its hiddenness together with the seeming impenetrability of its mores, its very status as an interstice, together with the obvious fact that it was a space of radical organizing, to, 
added to its threatening power. To eliminate this power, the state eventually sought during World War I to not only eliminate the IWW, but to eliminate the jungle, to bring tramping workers into visibility, as it were, and to thereby weaken their subversive potential. Jungles were only one form of political encampment for tramping workers, hobos, and homeless people. In the midst of economic depressions, various armies of the poor formed to march on state capitals and Washington, D.C., where they often encamped at length, making demands upon the state. Coxey's and Kelly's armies of the 1893 Depression provided the precedent, but a further Kelly's army in California in 1913 and the so-called bonus marchers of the Great Depression, who were cleared out of their encampment by the U.S. Army quite violently, showed the threatening power that organized destitute workers and homeless people could sometimes possess, especially if they were successful in controlling both the spaces and the places of their radicalism. Coxey's and Kelly's armies commandeered trains. They encamped in mass in empty lots, city streets, and farmers' fields. They marched. They took space, and from it, they planned and organized their further moves. It is not surprising, then, that the 1913 Kelly's army met with such fierce resistance when it camped in Sacramento, California, not far from the State House. The resistance of fire hoses and horse charges determined to, determined to roust them from their encampment and push them out of a city that it, they had quickly come to dominate. Yet in this instance, it was not only the interstices that mattered, but also the way organized poor and homeless people managed to transform a center, the center of Sacramento, into the interstices, into a tent city at the heart of a city that had real political effectivity and thus was a real threat to bourgeois business as usual. Together, jungles and marches and the seeming ability of tramping workers to disappear into the margins led to panic after tramp panic, creating something like an era of the tramp scare that lasted from the 1870s into the 1940s. Of equal importance to the bonus, march, uh, to the bonus marches as the Great Depression deepened, were the innumerable Hoovervilles, squatter settlements derisively named for the president who led, them, led the nation into depression that sprang up in cities and countryside alike. Squatters built shacks in New York Central Park and other Hoovervilles climbed the banks of the Harlem River to which they would return in the 1980s. In California, shack towns filled empty lots in all the major cities. Encampments of tents, wooden and cardboard boxes, and of brush filled the river bottoms and irrigation ditch banks in the agricultural countryside. These margins, too, possessed the potential to unleash a new and scary politics, as John Steinbeck's Tom Joad, perhaps America's most famous Hooverville resident, made clear in his famous soliloquy near the end of The Grapes of Wrath. I'll be everywhere, wherever you look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. And when our folks eat the stuff they raise and live in the houses they build, why, I'll be there. I think, uh, actually, John, um, who played him? Who's that? Um, that famous actor. Henry Fonda, thank you. He does that better than me. Um, in the wake of World War II, however, such mass interstitial living began to evaporate. In some instances, in rural California, for example, tent and shack cities in unincorporated areas were gradually transformed into more settled, if still informally built, settlements. Labor markets were altered as much labor was decasualized, and that which wasn't, such as the agricultural work in California, was handed over to Mexican guest workers in a federally sponsored plan to drive domestic, that is, citizen and long-term immigrant labor, out of the fields. Armies of undocumented workers were also assiduously recruited, many of them living in brush encampments in the desert and ravines, or squatting in, or in fact, under abandoned farmhouses. The face of homelessness at the same time in cities changed. Skid rows became largely the domain of older men who were frequently alcoholic. Skid rows were then soon subjected to the one-two punch of urban renewal followed by gentrification, further radicalizing, radically altering their nature as an outsider's space. With the exception of rural encampments of undocumented workers, tent city-like encampments seemed to fade from the scene in the post-war but pre-neoliberal era. 
Hobo jungles had largely become a thing of the past. Now so safe they could, for example, be nostalgically recreated in an annual hobo convention in Britt, Iowa. With the Reagan revolution, tent cities returned. Already declining during the Carter administration, the public housing budget was cut in half in the first Reagan budget and slashed and slashed again in the years that followed. In fact, since 1996, there has been absolutely no money budgeted for new public housing in the United States. Though subsidized housing vouchers still exist, usually, well, always with a waiting list of tens of thousands of families in every major jurisdiction. Disability and mental health support budgets were likewise slashed, and the inevitable effects of unsupported deinstitutionalization quickly made themselves felt in the city. The deep recession of 1982-1983, and the, in many ways, in many ways, which was in many ways a culmination of the increasingly severe <laughs> series of post-Keynesian re recessions that marked the 1970s as well as a further deepening of the great U-turn of America's industrial political economy. These threw working families out of their homes and sent them either on the road or into skid row districts in search of work and lodging. But the new face of homelessness was increasingly dark and increasingly female, while the new fact of homelessness, uh, homelessness expressed itself in the old form, shanty towns and tent cities. One of the most famous tent cities was in Los Angeles, Los Angeles's Skid Row, and called Justiceville. Constructed on a sidewalk in 1985, Justiceville was led by the charismatic Ted Hayes, and in some ways reflected the cult of personality that developed around him. This cult had its important effects, bringing significant attention to the plight of homeless people in Skid Row, and the city's ongoing attempts to uproot their encampments both of which were memorialized in a documentary film and, in fact, a Motown song. For some, the cult of personality, and indeed the rather dictatorial manner in which Justiceville was run, encouraged defection, even before the Los Angeles city government moved to close Justiceville down. Not far away, therefore, Love Camp, another encampment of, the homel of homeless people, this one, at least slightly more cooperatively organized, developed. And it, in fact, had early on a little bit of support from nearby businesses. For some home homeless residents of Love Camp, the camp became so supportive that residents attempted to remain on the sidewalk and build quasi-permanent structures, plywood homes, as a personal long-term solution to more transient homeless existence. The intent was not to rejoin the, the mainstream society, but instead to remain as a member of a homeless community. Such a move to stability and autonomy, however, is something that most cities simply cannot countenance. As with Camden's transitional park a generation later, Love Camp was swept away, its residents dispersed. It took so long for us to build that up, one resident of Love Camp said, and it took five minutes to tear it down. Innumerable similar justice bills, love camps, dignity villages, and more developed around the United States, pushed and shoved around the wasteland of the wastelands of the city, as at times city officials tolerated their presence as the least bad option, and at other times sought to shut them down. They were joined by encampments on riverbanks, under on-ramps, and on disused rail lines. And they grew in number, size, and precariousness as the Reagan era gave way to the Clinton era. Such spaces moved around, but they never disappeared. In good times and in bad, Tent City comes and goes, as investigative reporter Ben Ehrenreich has written. It forms and scatters and takes shape again. Sometimes they take official shape with architect's help. After Justiceville was chased around Skid Row a few times, for example, Ted Hayes managed to secure a fenced site and a $255,000 grant from the oil company Arco to erect 20 geodesic domes for homeless people designed by an acolyte of Buckminster Fuller. Fuller. Dome Village lasted until 2006 when the owner of the land reclaimed it, which Ted Hayes claims was part of an anti-Republican campaign, because Ted Hayes may be, if you don't know this, America's only Rasta Republican. <laughs> Dignity Village in Portland, now more than 20 years old, calls itself a campground for the homeless and boasts a flashy website, a board of directors, and a Facebook presence. Like Dome Village, 
was, it is an official nonprofit corporation and has garnered a great deal of popular and critical attention. But encampments like these are also, and importantly, fenced and carefully policed. And the, and the historical geography of Tent City is replete with such attempts at corralling and containing homeless people. As street homelessness continued to grow in Los Angeles in the 1990s, the city made plans to develop what they called a drop-in center, funded in part by a large grant from the US Department of Housing and Development. A city official described the drop-in center as a fenced-in urban campground where up to 800 people could take a shower and sleep on a lawn. The city planned to purchase a hidden away vacant lot in Skid Row, put a fence around a large lawn on the site, and build a 50 bed shelter that would also house some social services. Homeless people would be bused to the site from near various places around the city and locked up for the night. Homeless advocate and UCLA law professor Gary Blasey called the plan a first step on a slippery slope to concentration camps in rural areas for homeless people. Mark those words. Eventually, the plan for an overnight camping lawn was dropped, though due more to merchant than homeless advocate opposition, and the drop-in center itself was long stalled. Plans for such fenced encampments are not rare, and they continue down to this day. Ontario, California has managed to build one of its own. Its Temporary Homeless Service Area, or THSA, is a formalized and fenced tent city that the police had long been directing homeless people to. In March 2008, after herding the local homeless population to Tent City, police and code enforcement officers descended on the encampment and required its inhabitants to prove that they are residents of the city of Ontario. Those who could not, all but 127, were evicted. The city bulldozed and graded the field, erected orderly rows of matching green tents, issued ID cards to those who remained, fenced the encampment, and posted a list of rules. No entry after 10 p.m., no alcohol, no pets, no minors, no visitors. Now private security guards patrol THHSA's perimeters, ejecting anyone who doesn't have permission to be there, including reporters. As Ben Ehrenreich goes on to detail, none of Tent City's residents I interviewed from just outside the fence complained much. They were fed three meals a day and were otherwise left alone. The rules were infantilizing, but the people largely shrugged them off. Still, more than a third of those permitted to stay in the THSA have left for good. No new arrivals have been admitted. Isaac Jackson, coordinator of the county's Office of Homeless Services, credited Ontario with doing a great job of re reducing tent cities' population. Neither city nor county officials, though, knew if any of those who have left the tent city had found a better source of shelter than a tent. It seems unlikely. Aaron Reich's in-depth accounts of struggles over tent cities in contemporary California came in the wake of massive publicity surrounding <coughs> Sacramento's bulging tent cities on the bank of the American River in, the late, in late 2008. Media glare had been shined on Sacramento by Oprah Winfrey, who saw it as a parad paradigmatic of the new poverty becoming visible in the wake of the burst financial and housing bubbles. Sacramento was the epicenter and epicenter of foreclosures in 2007, and it remained a deeply affected place in 2008. But as Aaron Reich makes so clear, the residents of Sacramento's tent city were largely not those newly evicted, but ones who had long since been evicted from the mainstream economy and from standard housing. Tent City, he writes, tells the grueling backstory of the current recession. Nearly 30 years of cuts in social services to the poor and mentally ill, the decimation of the industrial economy, and the cruel underside of the housing boom. Contemporary tent cities, then, are not evidence of capitalism in crisis, but of contemporary capitalism in full flower. They are what they have always been, deeply troubling interstitial spaces, only by dint of which capital's reserve army can, be, can survive. Whether or not that survival has radical or revolutionary potential or is merely infantilizing, or now with a space to be, simply just is. Ben Ehrenreich is, of course, correct when he argues that Sacramento's tent city was not only a symbol of the current economic crisis, but part of the backstory 
of that crisis. The, results of a long, the result of a long history of disinvestment, upward wealth redistribution, the attack on the state, and the veneration of markets. It is proof positive of the nature of the good life that neoliberalism has made for a few. It is also proof positive that the bourgeoisie still has no more solution to the housing problem than it did in Engels' day. Sacramento's tent city is a case in point. Transient encampments of greater or lesser duration had long existed on the wasteland by the American River that Oprah brought to the world's attention in early 2009. The iteration she found had grown to some 200 or 300 residents over the past year out of more than 1,200 homeless people in Sacramento. Some residents had long been homeless in the city. Others became homeless or moved to the city recently. Divided into self-governing neighborhoods, tent city residents had self-sorted themselves based on interests, affinity, tolerance for drugs and alcohol and the like. Joan Burke, who works at the nearby Loaves and Fishes Homeless Services Agency said, there is a sort of very pure democracy and self-governance at play. People are making up the rules of their clusters of tents, deciding what's permitted, just in, as in any sort of community. You don't want to ro romanticize this. It isn't camping. But there is a community and a sense of helping others. We've had a series of storms here recently, and, there's something, some, and if there's somebody new who doesn't have a tent, people will take them in. It's that understanding that you know there's somebody worse off than I am. In other words, something like the ethos of the jungle was being recreated precisely as a means of survival. The global attention to Sacramento's tent city, therefore, quickly made it intolerable. New neoliberal mayor Kevin Johnson quickly announced plans to clear out tent city, arguing that while there has to be some compassion towards the homeless, Sacramento also needed to exercise what he called tough love, which is, of course, classic urban right code for stripping homeless people of their autonomy and humanity. He also argued that Sacramento had to adopt a zero tolerance policy towards homeless encampments. Johnson therefore announced a plan in March 2009 to open a wintertime emergency shelter on the grounds of the California State Fair, a shelter that would be highly regulated, fenced, locked at night, but within which residents would not be separated from their partners or their pets, and where there would be at least some provision for the self -storage, uh, safe storage of belongings. Many of those residents in Tent City resisted this plan. People out here are not going to go anywhere where they're going to lock you in, as one of them put it. Would you go anywhere where they're going to turn the key and lock you in at night? No. As another said, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'd just like to be left alone here myself. I like it here where I'm at, so I don't know what's going to go on. I'm not really very happy about it. But as the national public radio reporter covering the story, Richard Gonzalez, closed one of his stories, being left alone isn't in the cards, given Mayor Johnson's talk of tough love and zero tolerance. Sacramento's tent city was duly shut down at the end of March 2009, and some 200 homeless people, not all of them tent city residents, moved into the winter shelter at the fairgrounds. On July 1st, the, winter, the fairground shelter was closed, and these residents found themselves back out on the streets. In the wake of the closure, homeless people, including many of whom uh, who had many of whom who had never moved to the, the fairgrounds, but insist, instead retreated more deeply into the brush, marched through Sacramento and demanded a right to camp. Setting up a symbolic tent in an empty lot next to a police station, they demanded a civil liberty that ought to be already exist, which is that people have a right to be, to live without the threat of being incarcerated in their own country. One of those protesting described his life since Tent City was closed at the end of March. When we moved out, we moved over to a private area two fields over. They wanted us off there too, just like shuttling cattle. That's all it is. We're supposed to be an eyesore, but actually we're citizens and we're human beings. We're supposed to have rights like everybody else. It don't matter what we have in our pockets. He had spent his time just one step ahead of the police, seeking out any sort of shelter. He likely lived off and on in one or another of the dozen or so small tent encampments in Sacramento that continued to pop up and just as quickly are shut down by police. Advocates for the homeless have thus been agitating for what they call a safe ground, a legal campground, so they're not hounded from place to place and they're not subject to citations and arrest. 
Mayor Johnson says he's open to the idea, but he also says, I do not believe that people should be able to camp, you know, illegally anywhere in the city at this particular time. The creation of such safe ground is not a novel idea. Twenty years ago, the city of Miami was required by court order to create such a safe haven for homeless people, and eventually it set aside an area under a highway overpass where homeless people could be free from arbitrary police sweeps, the confiscation of their belongings, arrests for loitering or sleeping in public, and in the event that led to the lawsuit from which the court order resulted, being roused from their sleep in a park and handcuffed while their belongings were thrown in a pile and lit on fire by the police. They have, however, these safe spaces, however, have sparked new interest as the question of the very survival of homeless people continues to force itself into the consciousness of city managers and the public alike. Homeless people in Nashville, Tennessee, for example, have been living in encampments under an interstate overpass next to the Cumberland River for perhaps two decades. According to city, a city council member, the camp was pretty extensive with some shelters possessing roofs and stoves and pirated electricity occasionally available. Over the years, he said, we found that it is a lot of individuals who are trying to uh, find some sort of refuge from the mean streets, from the violence and disorder they see in other parts of the city as they're homeless. Interstitial space in Nashville has served as a safe haven and as the tent city's population has grown during the economic crisis, the city has decided not to raise it, but to monitor it, and as one of uh, city manager put it, to put case management services around these people to help move them out of homelessness. The problem of, of safe havens is a difficult one. It is probably most difficult in how quickly such safe harbors can be hijacked, as the case of the city of Ontario, California makes clear. A, re a related problem is how tenuous they can be. If Nashville's tent city seems to have been granted at least a small degree of stability, the same has not been true of Camden's or Sacramento's or St. Petersburg, Florida's, where in December 2006, church groups gave out tents to some 30 homeless people living under Interstate 375. At the new year, the tent city, now called Coming Up, moved across the street to a vacant lot owned by the St. Vincent de Paul Society, where it grew to about 140 residents. Residents, the majority of whom worked full time, signed a contract with each other pledging four hours of community work a week to keep the grounds clean, cleaning the portable toilets, cutting hair, mediating disputes, and so forth. Such self-organization quickly prompted city officials, over the objections of some city council members, it should be said, to declare a crisis and to order St. Vincent de Paul to evict the residents under an old law that prohibited people from living in tents anywhere in the city, even on private property. The city pledged to find a vacant building to use as a winter shelter, but it had no intention of delaying the evictions until it did, a position that led to strenuous protests by people and the, by homeless people and their advocates, including a large protest at the mayor's church. However, threatened with daily fines of $250 for code violations, St. Vincent de Paul complied with city orders to shut down the camp. And some residents therefore moved back to one of two encampments under an underpass, while others accepted one-time rent vouchers of $550, which would allow them to stay in a motel for two weeks or more. Others merely disappeared. Soon after the St. Vincent site was closed down, two homeless men were murdered in a single night. An extraordinary city council meeting followed, shedding further light on the dangers faced by homeless people living on the streets. Even so, let's see if I can get this to actually work. Go. Go. Even so, a week after the murders, with no suspects yet apprehended, city police entered the two small tent cities that had sprung up in the wake of St. Vincent's closing, slashing the tents from their bases and moorings with knives, box cutters, and scissors, and confiscating them. They claimed fire code violations. Though precisely which ones and whether they actually applied or not remained unclear in official explanations. They claimed they cut up the tents to avoid physical altercations with homeless people who might have refused to let them confiscate their properties if the cops had asked. 
The move was ineffective, however, as homeless advocates secured new tents within eight hours and the camps were reestablished. They don't have petty people here, so. Now the next challenge. <coughs> or you can just watch this. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Moreover, the videos of the raid, which we were just looking at, were quickly posted on YouTube, attracting significant national attention and encouraging fast backtracking by the mayor and other city officials. In turn, nearby businesses and residents organized to assure the permanent elimination of the tent cities, holding rallies and protests at which they claimed the tent cities encouraged crime, threatened property values, and undermined business. As a result, the city held a homeless summit, one result of which was a change in city codes, outlawing tents on public rights of way, but allowing them under certain conditions on private property. And, the opening of, and they also, at the same time, opened negotiations with St. Vincent de Paul to have it host a tent city once again on the very site the city had forced it to close down only a few weeks before, but this time as a collaborative effort among homeless advocates, the city, and St. Vincent de Paul. In the meantime, the city and various charities worked to move those living in the other tent cities, uh, in, in that tent city and the others, into other housing, and in some instances to provide jobs. By late February, more than 100 tent city residents and other homeless people had been moved to apartments and treatment centers with the aid of a $500,000 grant from, Catholic, from the Catholic Diocese. But with every homeless person or couple who found a new place to live, another arrived from, from somewhere to take the pla their place in a tent, doing nothing to dampen the growing backlash from neighbors. The city continued to work on tightening its laws against camping and sleeping in public, as well as against panhandling, and announced plans for a temporary use permit for the St. Vincent site, which would only allow 75 tents and for no more than 90 days. The tent city residents and their advocates demanded, however, that the St. Vincent tent city be allowed to remain open indefinitely as long as there was need. They also demanded an equal voice in running the camp, the entrance of new residents as current ones found other housing, that the city abandon its plan to require all residents to wear identifying armbands, that none be placed in a new shelter being planned, which they felt would be unsafe and would represent a great, a great loss of our autonomy. The city refused all those demands and threatened those who refused to move from the underpass to the new tent city under the city's conditions with arrest. Nonetheless, when the new laws were passed and the St. Vincent tent city reopened in mid-March, the two satellite cities appeared abandoned and the new site quickly filled. Other homeless people moved to a new tent city on church property in another district of the city which parishioners had created despite the objections of nearby neighbors. The second city, the new city on the St. Vincent property was called this time New Hope City, and it ran by strict rules. The lot was fenced. Residents had to wear identifying wristbands at all times. Alcohol was forbidden. There was a midnight curfew when the gates were locked. When a resident moved out, a new one could not take its play, her place. Together, these rules posed a problem. 27 residents were evicted for drinking or violating curfew, which is to say it's not just that they could not enter the grounds after midnight, it was that like teenagers with strict parents, they could not be out after midnight. 72 received housing vouchers for one month. As these ran out, these former tent city residents could not return. Many therefore ended up living furtively on the streets. By early May, New Hope City was empty. The homeless street population, however, had not shrunk at all, and City Council turned its attention to new anti-panhandling laws to police those still on the streets. Homeless people and an advocate set up a protest encampment on the site of one of the satellite tent cities under the highway, leading to three arrests. And other homeless residents of the Slash tent city sued the city for damages, which the city sought to settle with a $250 one-time payment. Over the summer, with no other place to go, dozens of homeless people took to sleeping on the sidewalk in front of City Hall, which the city was unable to do anything about because its new anti-camping ordinance could only be enforced if there were shelter beds available, and there were not. 
now not even in a tent city. Determined to learn from this experience, the city of St. Petersburg and surrounding Pinellas County began planning early for the following winter's homeless crisis. They planned this time to encourage the homeless to live in a controlled encampment built so far out of the way you will never see it unless you search for it. A central plank of the county's 10-year plan to end homelessness, which is a federal mandate, the Pinellas Hope Tent City was to be built on 10 acres of litter-strewn scrub owned by the Catholic Diocese in an industrial zoned area more than 10 miles from the city. It would consist of 125 tents housing 225 people, three excess modular buildings donated by the school district for laundry facilities, a kitchen and administrative offices, two large communal tents for eating and socializing in, and it would be fenced. Security guards would be hired. Background checks would be conducted on all potential residents. Neighbors, that the neighbors, a scrapyard, a construction company, trucking companies, and the like, nonetheless raised concerns about thefts and safety. Despite concerns that homeless people would not accept the distant Pinellas Hope with its strict rules and fences, the tent city quickly filled to capacity, even as a fairly large encampment re remained in front of City Hall by those who refused to go and who were protesting city and county policies. Catholic Charities, which managed the site, nonetheless stuck to its promise to close Pinellas Hope on April 30th. One of the things we want to do is to have people in Pinellas Hope think, what's my next step? We're not trying to create a tent city that people can live in permanently, in the words of Catholic Charities president, the Catholic Charities president. By the time it was scheduled to close at the end of April 2008, Pinellas Hope had housed 490 people, of whom 148 found other temporary housing, 122 found jobs, and more than 200 simply went missing, probably returning to the streets. Donations had also been raised to allow a scaled down version of the camp, housing 50 to 75 people to stay open through September. The reduction in size was going to be achieved by evicting homeless residents who showed no signs of progress as the president, again, of the Catholic Charities put it. As of the end of 2010, the camp, which now has an annual budget of $2.5 million, remained open. And indeed, officials think it is a success. They think it is such a success that they have changed housing and zoning laws to allow for the creation of more permanent camp campgrounds like Pinellas Hope, seeking to replicate this campground at a site in nearby Hillsbury County, the home to the city of, of Tampa, which hosts the largest homeless population in the state, despite vigorous protests of various property owners and residents. In essence, the support of some local officials, with the support of some local officials, Catholic Charities has sought to create an authoritarian network of camps in out of sight and out of the way places to warehouse homeless people. They were not totally successful. Hillsbury County commissioners rejected a plan for a second Pinellas Hope-like encampment on their turf, much to the delight of area residents. But at Pinellas Hope, there seems to be a retrenchment, perhaps along the lines of Dignity Village, as tents and casitas are now being replaced with small, subsidized apartments. From Camden to St. Petersburg, these mark out the ends of two trajectories of tent cities in contemporary United States, and they represent two different outcomes of the ongoing war of position that is the permanent condition of homelessness in capitalism's heartland. As homeless people have been chased from doorstep to public park and from public park to abandoned lot or interstate overpass, as shelters and now sometimes semi-permanent tent cities for the homeless and hungry are now more and now less tolerated by city elites, housed residents and businesses, and as homeless people themselves have been variously positioned as either deserving aid or not, tent cities, shanty towns and new jungles have remained constant. For many on the left, such encampments sometimes represent important interstitial spaces not only of survival, but especially of autonomy and of organizing. The space of Tent City must for that reason be preserved. There is much to be said in favor of this argument. The history of homelessness in the United States has shown that jungles and encampments have indeed been vital to poor people's sometimes radical organizing and to their dignity. 
Indicatively, the Saint Pe in St. Petersburg, the Pinellas Hope was promoted by some of its advocates precisely as a means of quieting more radical demands by homeless people and their advocates. Pinellas Hope would create a more orderly, more controlled, less political space, and to the degree that it did, then more radical encampments like the one on the city hall steps could be shut down. So too Sacramento's emergency shelter at the fairgrounds. It was, in part, a means of breaking apart both a social and a political community that had formed on the banks of the American River. And so too, of course, also Camden's tent city. These moves against the political encampments of homeless people argue that indeed such spaces need to be fought for and defended. And yet it must be remembered, as one St. Pete tent city activist put it, tent city is not the crisis, it's the conditions that cause the tent city that's the crisis. At the same time, the rights of homeless people to occupy and mobilize in the interstices of in the interstices are struggled for, in other words, we must recognize that tent cities, we must recognize tent cities for what they are, evidence of the utter failure of the capitalist city to provide for its residents. Not only does struggling Rust Belt Camden make this clear, but so too does Sun Belt St. Pete to say nothing of once booming Sacramento. What must be fought for, in other words, is not only the protection of tent cities, but especially the destruction of a system that has made them an inevitable part of the urban <clears throat> landscape. We need to start find ways, finding ways to eliminate tent cities from the urban landscape, not to clear them out, as the neoliberal urban right and neoliberal urban leftish would have us do, and not to replace them with fenced-in campsites run by charities hidden away in the scrub, but rather to make them superfluous rather than necessary. If the bourgeoisie still has no solution to the housing problem, then we need to find a non-bourgeois solution. And here, ironically, tent cities, though they must be eliminated if a just city is to arrive, arise, provide the model. As a taking of land, as a non-commodified and cooperative form of property and social relations, as potentially an organizational space, tent cities and their progenitors like the hobo jungle have much to teach us here in the moment of Occupy Wall Street and all of its offspring about what it will take to create a truly democratic right to the city. Thank you. Um, Don, that was extraordinary, fantastic beginning to the day. Um, we're going to have time for a couple of questions, um, and I'm going to kick off. I I'm not really going to kick off with a question. Um, there are, that you've given us so much rich information, it's extraordinary. But it, it, two things struck me. First of all, um, in a way what you're describing, um, uh, through, particularly at the end, through your, through your naming and shaming of the kind of bourgeois response to this, is in a way a capitalization of the tent city in many ways, that actually the way that charities are involved, it's a kind of new form of public-private partnership that's here. So one solution to tent cities is to kind of bring them into the capitalist fold in some kind of way. And the other thing that struck me uh, in, as the complete opposite to that, that, um, that, that was very present in your last statements, was the radicality of the idea of being, uh, it, was, it was gendered, you said being a man without property, but of course we could degender it, being a person without, a public person without property, and how extraordinarily um, radical that sounds to be able to say, you know, we, we are in the center of the city and we have no property. I mean, that seems extraordinary. Uh, thanks, and, and luckily I was quoting when I said men without property. Uh, yeah, very luckily. <laughs> and I was talking about an article from the, the mid-1970s where, you know, language... Yeah, there was so, feminism in the mid-1970s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm a little bit safe. Uh, but uh, but your, your points are, are very well taken, and, and this, this kind of capitalization on tent cities and the, the formation of these new public-private par partnerships and kind of the uh, NGOization of them is, yeah. is a crucial point. One of the antecedents to contemporary uh, tent cities like Pinellas Hope in the United States were the Farm Security Administration labor camps of the 1930s. Farm Security Administration was a federal agency which uh, farmers Big farmers hated, absolutely hated. 
But what they did is they created a set of uh, public uh, campgrounds that were incredibly well uh, designed. They often had uh, really great architects and landscape architects involved and so forth. Very well designed and that were run, there was a bit of paternalism in them that, that remained, but they were very much run by, uh, by councils of their residents. And they were very much a cooperative form of uh, property, a very different notion of, uh, of what was at stake than what, say, Catholic Charities is up to in Florida. And so they were shut down. Uh, and by 1946, growers, farmers, had gained control over all of them and eventually transferred them to local public housing authorities that they controlled. Uh, and precisely as a means to, of dampening down the radicalism that was possible in a place that was controlled by its residents. Right? And so that, that, that back history is actually an important part of it, which kind of has, is being recapitulated in many ways, I think, in the current moment. Yeah, and, and, and this, is the, this is the place, as you ended, that we really need to go back and understand very properly in order to think about how um, it might provide a, a way of moving through capitalism towards right. an outside. There was a great irony in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the use of the geodesic dome, of course. Right. I mean, I think that probably many people in the audience particularly like that. Um, let's open it up to questions. We've got a couple of time. It could be questions or statements. There's lots of roving microphones, so um, put your hand up and then wait for a microphone and perhaps just say very quickly who you are as well, it'd be useful. Anybody? Yes, yes somebody here. Hi, Don, thank you very much for, for the lecture. Hi, uh, van der Werf, I'm from SCORE. I have a question about, um, in your presentation, uh, there is a question of a, a, a claim, uh, a claim for a, cl a spatial claim, but also a claim of visibility in many of the protests that went along with uh, the situation in, in various ten cities. Um, now we have the very uh, acute situation of the various Occupy uh, initiatives taking place in various cities, where the tent plays uh, an equally symbolic role, you could say, in claiming space. Um, as you just mentioned, there's also a very interesting way that people are organizing themselves uh, using actually similar uh, systems uh, that the homeless people use. And actually, I, I heard on the news in New York, homeless people are actually advising uh, the residents of Occupy during the recent snowstorms how to survive better on the street. Um, th I think that's a very interesting situation. Do, do you maybe have a, a, a position in that? Do you, do you, how do you see the parallel between these two? Yeah, I, the parallels are exact in many ways. And one, one of the things that... Um, uh, it, it's interesting, you know, there's, there is this long history of both political encampments and homeless encampments, and sometimes politicized homeless encampments. And that history and the current moment of the Occupy movement has to come together, right, for precisely the reasons that you're outlining. It's only incipient in the discourses around Occupy at the moment. I, I was quoting quite a lot from Ben Ehrenreich, his mother, Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, has written a, a brilliant piece about the demonization of homeless people for doing exactly what the Occupy uh, people are doing, right? The demonization of them by exactly those parts of the media that have come around to saying maybe there's something important in what the, the Occupy people are doing. It was, it was on Tom Dispatch and it's been picked up in a lot of other places. It's, it's really worth a read because um, what she points to very, very well is, um, is that who is in those encampments matters, right? And we have so thoroughly demonized the homeless that we can't see the degree to which when they are doing exactly what those who we might now think of as political heroes are doing, um, that, uh, that it is the same thing, right? And that's important. Then, then your point about, um, about uh, homeless people teaching people to survive in uh, you know, the public squares of the cities is, is vital, right? I mean, there's no one who's better at living in the city than a homeless person, uh, because they have to be. Another question or comment? It is the beginning of the day. Here we have a question. Thank you. You want to hear Martha? Uh, I was particularly struck with the slide of um, the Bowery, uh, the, you know, the, where the, in, in Lower Manhattan, and sort of just a, a, a slipping reference to gentrification, yeah. and of course picking up on Andrea's exhortation about the role, the role of artists. Uh, I think artists have been complicit in a lot of this. Don, it might not be fair to, to ask Don to respond to that, but thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I agree. <laughs> but actually, on the, on the basis of your mention of the Bowery, 
this is a very nice transition right. to, to think of the term. I, I was also struck by the fact that the concept of transition, which of course is inimical and um, vital in, your co in, in the conversation you're having about homeless, is also one of those terms that we bandy around pretty freely in theoretical discourses around art as a very positive thing. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a contradiction perhaps in that. But Don, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. There is one more question. Okay, we have time for one short question. Uh, Tati Flego, also a colleague of Hubs at SCORE. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was just wondering, because we are in the Netherlands now, and there's this rich, long-standing tradition of social housing, so actually city planning and organizing housing. And there seems to be that lack of social housing history in the US. So therefore, does that allow for these non-cities, I would almost call them, to happen. Though in the Netherlands, we also have that tradition, not necessarily the tents that Hype was talking about, but we do have camps. We have non-cities that are sort of part of the outskirts of cities, and it's in big cities and rural areas where there are mobile homes, and basically people don't have a postal code. They exist. You can't and you can find them on Google Earth. I was just wondering, can you touch base a little upon the differences between having that rich social housing history and that non-existence of it? Well, Thank I, you. Thanks. Uh, that's a really good question, and, and of course, I am, uh, I am no expert on the Netherlands. Uh, and so forgive me as I you know, kind of destroy your history here. But um, there's, um, that, that rich history matters it, it, because you know, there's a path dependency to how we engage with the world. And so that, that rich history really matters. What's available, that, that long history of seeing housing as a right, even if it is under threat, right, is crucial. Housing has never been a right in the United States. In fact, the Supreme Court has explicitly said that there is no right to housing. In, in the United States, uh, there's a um, so so that those histories matter deeply. I, I'm I fear under kind of the the current assault that we're all under uh, that there is, if you'll pardon the expression, an Americanization of social policy uh, going on, where we are merely uh, you know the leading edge of what is an increasingly global phenomenon with differences, of course, right? Uh, and to me, I find that totally appalling, quite honestly. And so, so the trick will be to find ways to draw on that history, to draw on that notion of housing as a right, to maintain it, while also not forgetting the degrees of autonomy, uh, sovereignty, uh, and uh, collaborative living that is possible in these other kinds of non-cities, as you are calling them, right? And to find ways to negotiate that um, difference as well is, uh, I think, absolutely vital. Don, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Don to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great.